Good morning. This is Virtual PBX Dash Admin Training. Uh, what you should be seeing on your screen is the Dash login page, uh, which is just dash.virtualpbx.com. This is Virtual PBX Dash Admin Training. Uh, if you're on the Virtual PBX website, uh, you just want to go under Support, just mouse over it, choose on the left-hand side Dash, and then there's the Dash login link there. Uh, to log in, you use your email address. Uh, so if you just signed up, that would be the email address you use to sign up with us. Uh, password, which should have been emailed to you. Uh, and then your account name, which is typically your company name. You obviously have the choice here to click Remember Me, so that way you don't have to keep typing it in. Uh, and if you ever forget, you have your forgot info link here. And then after that, you click Sign In. And yeah, what happened there? Oh, well, let's going to have to close that out. Try that one more time. And that error too. Looks like I'm having some problems today. Sorry about that. All right, that should get us in because it looks like I was using the wrong account name. All right, uh, so your first time logging in, the Dash Wizard will pop up. It's going to give you some account overview sort of information, basically, which you can always get back to by clicking on your name up here at the top. And then you can close that out. Once you're out of the wizard, you'll be here on the dashboard page. On the left-hand side, you've got your navigation uh, for the dashboard. So that's where you go to adjust your system settings. And we'll go through all of those. In the middle here, we've got your total users. So these are all the people on the account who can make and receive phone calls. Uh, because Dash is based on the number of users you have, each user you have or add will increase your bill. So just be aware of that. Then down below that, we have your total devices and then the breakdown between devices on the account cell phone, landline, soft phone is an application that you use on a computer or on a smartphone these days to make and receive calls, usually using your internet connection. Uh, SIP phone, at least that's how, yeah, SIP phone is a, t is a particular type of VoIP phone, right? So VoIP is voice over internet protocol. It's a, you know, standard desk office phone you pick up, you dial, whatever. Um, however, there are different versions of VoIP phones on the market and SIP is a particular type of web phone that is compatible with Dash. Uh, and then, let's see, a web phone that is basically allows you to use your web browser, currently that's Chrome and Firefox, to make and receive phone calls from your computer. So that's another kind of web phone. Uh, and then unregistered in the red numbers there just lets you know, hey, these web devices aren't connected which means we can't send calls to them or get calls from them. Over here to the right, main number, and you see I have a couple phone numbers listed here. 
these are the numbers your customers call to get to your phone system, right, to navigate through and speak to you and your staff. These numbers all behave the same way, meaning they'll have the same main greeting that will play, and they'll all have the same routing. Down below that, you'll see here I have a fax box number, so this means I can take incoming faxes and receive them. You can also have another section here for a conference number if you're making use of the conference bridge. Then we got total numbers. Notice this account has 35 phone numbers, which is a lot for most accounts. On Dash, your plan usually includes anywhere from one to three phone numbers as part of your monthly plan, so you're not charged for those first phone numbers. Once you go over that initial allotment, then you'll be charged $4.99 per month per phone number. So bear that in mind. And that doesn't matter if you add them through Dash or if you port them in. It's just a total number of phone numbers. Down here, we've got a breakdown between assigned numbers and spare numbers. So an assigned number is a number you're using. It goes somewhere. It will ring to something, right? Whether that's going directly to a person or staff member, goes to a ring group, goes to an ACDQ, it's one of your main numbers, it's your conference number, it's your fax box number, right? All of those are assigned because they're make, being in, made use of. Excuse me. Then we got spare numbers. These are extra numbers on your account, meaning you own them, you're just not using them. They don't ring to anybody. Now, you're still going to be charged for them, so hopefully you do have a plan in place to make use of them at some point, or you're going to eventually get rid of them. You just haven't decided yet. Down below, we got the breakdown here between USDID, meaning a U.S. local number, right? So I have like a, I have Las Vegas phone numbers. I've got San Jose phone numbers, et cetera. Uh, and then U.S. toll-free, meaning 800-888-877-866-855-844. You can also have another section here for international numbers. If you want to add an international number to your Dash account, you actually need to contact our porting team. That's porting, P-O-R-T-I-N-G, at virtualpbx.com. They will need to know the city and country that you're interested in. And having a number, they'll let you know, A, if that's possible, uh, B, if there's additional requirements in terms of documentation that we'll need, uh, and then they'll get the number. Now, getting international numbers can vary in terms of pricing. There's usually an acquisition fee, which on average starts around $20, but it can go up. Um, I think we saw one at like $40,000 once. Um, so yeah, but we will prize you of that kind of fee ahead of time so you can make a decision. All right, down here we've got your company directory, which you notice here I have 11 users in it, even though my total users on the account is 21. So what that means is when I set these users up, only 11 of them did I say, hey, you're going to be in the user directory. The other 10 are not. I can change that at any time. It's just I basically did it for an example so people would, could see this. And then you can always download this directory. Next up, we've got the account ID. This long alphanumeric string is technically your account number. Uh, however, if you ever call in to support or billing, we're typically going to ask you for your company name because we're not expecting you to read off a bunch of letters and numbers to us and have us understand it the first time. Uh, obviously, if you email into us or chat, you can always just cut and paste that in and we can look you up that way as well. Next is the account realm. This is only used in a couple things. Uh, so number one, people, you could use this for programming a third-party device, whether that's a VoIP phone that isn't auto-provisionable, which we'll be getting to shortly, or um, a third-party cell phone application. So like uh, XLite from Counterpath is an example we typically use. And so you'd use that as part of the setup process of getting those applications or phones working. The other thing that this is used for is for faxing out. So for faxing out, we use email to fax. So you create an email in the to field. Uh, you put plus one, an area code and phone number of the fax number that you're faxing to, the at symbol, and then your account realm. Then you attach a PDF or a TIFF and send it out. Just make sure that's just one, P, uh, one attachment, no finger files or anything like that. All right, and number four. We have your store promo code. So just for being a Dash customer, you get a discount code for use in our web store. 
with the handy dandy link right up here. And you can use that towards getting white phones, getting a router, etc. And since we're back up here at the top, we'll click on caller ID. This is your default company caller ID. It's going to reflect one of your main numbers, uh, and you can select each one. Then the first field you've got to fill out is the company caller ID name or C name. This is restricted to 15 characters, including spaces or special characters. And that's an industry standard as far as I've been able to find out. Once you click on save, save changes rather, I think it is, um, this gets transmitted to all the carriers who support CNAME. They'll update their servers, and then it's in effect. Now, we don't control those servers, and that's why it can take about three business days for all of them to get updated. A couple things to keep in mind about CNAME. One, not every carrier that calls route through supports CNAME. So if your call happens to route through one of those carriers, your CNAME information is not getting through to your destination. Even for those carriers who do support CNAME, it's not a high priority for them. So if they're having higher than expected call volume, they're going to drop CNAME. Obviously, if they have a service issue, i.e. a maintenance issue, a backcode digs up a phone line, or a car accident knocks down telephone wires, whatever, hopefully your call will get through, but obviously CNAME would not get through in that case, depending on how they reroute calls. Uh, and then the most minor point about CNAME is if you're happening to call someone who already has your phone number programmed into their phone, whatever we send will not get through. It's what they have programmed on their device. That takes precedence. All right, now we have your company emergency or E911 address. So this is for your VoIP phones. This is the default address that would be sent out if anyone picks up a VoIP phone on your account and dials 911. So first and foremost, you want to make sure this is correct. Uh, one other thing to keep in mind is if you have staff in remote locations, each VoIP device can have its own E911 address. So that way they can have it set to their appropriate location. And then you would click Save Changes. All right, next up we've got Hold Music. So Dash allows you to upload Hold Music. Uh, it's either a .wav, .wav, or .mp3 file. A couple things to keep in mind. One, the file size needs to be one megabyte or smaller at the current time. Our engineers are working on getting that increased. You also want to make sure you record in mono and not in stereo. Right? Now default, like if you record on your computer, most of the time it's going to default to record in stereo because typically speaking, computers are stereo devices because they have multiple speakers, two typically. Right? However, when you listen to that recording over the phone, you only have the one speaker. What happens when you listen to a Stereo recording through a one speaker device like a phone is that you hear a lot of static. You may not even be able to hear your greeting, or you might be hearing like one out of five words. I've had at least one case where a customer actually didn't hear anything. They just had dead silence. Once they got it down to one channel, boom, their recording played fine. So make sure you record in mono. But then once you have that file, you can click Upload, you find the file on your computer, and then you click on the little blue and white up arrow icon here to upload that file as your hold music. Now, hold music on dash. Call comes in. Your inbound caller is hearing ringing. When your staff member picks up and starts talking and then needs to put them on hold, they press hold on their VoIP phone, this is the default music that's playing. That's what this is. And then we'll go to hours of operation, which is actually under our main number section. All right. So this is your office hour strategy. So by default, new accounts are set to 24-hour open office, meaning, hey, your account is ready to take calls. You just need to get everything set up. Now, a lot of people aren't open 24 hours. We get that. So that's where custom office hours comes in. For each day of the week that you're open, you put a check mark. Then you got these two boxes over here. These are actually pull downs. 
and you select your open hours in 24-hour or military time. One other handy-dandy thing right here at the very bottom, you can choose to be open or actually close, excuse me, you can choose to be closed for lunch hours. So if your whole office or, or location is closed for lunch, you put a check mark here and then enter when your lunch hours are. So then when that time hits, the system automatically puts you in lunch mode. You don't have to worry about it. Nothing you have to do. And then you would click on Save Changes. Next up, we've got office holidays. You can set your office holidays in advance. So first and foremost, if you're closed for holidays, you want to put, put a check mark here. And then you want to click Add Holiday. Now you've got your choice of single day, date range, and advanced. So single day, pretty straightforward. It's one day. And as an example here, we got President's Day. I just put the month here, February 20th, and I would click Save Changes. Now, one thing to keep in mind about single day holidays is once that day has passed, you probably don't want to update right away because then you might accidentally put yourself closed two days in a row, right, just because some single day holidays match more forward on the calendar. Obviously, if you had 4th of July in the United States, you can just leave that because it's always on the porch. It doesn't matter what day of the week. All right, date range. We'll go down here for Christmas, and you see here I put December 22nd and then through December 26th. So basically, from that point forward, I'm in holiday mode. Once the 26th is over, so on the 27th, boom, I'm back into open. Uh, and then advanced is this one up here. So the second Monday in March, we're closed every year. That doesn't matter. All right, company retreat. It doesn't matter what the date is. It's just the second Monday of that month. Now, one thing you may have noticed, or maybe not, but there is no dates or no years, excuse me, listed on the holidays. So this can be a problem for New Year's Eve to New Year's Day. So what we do recommend is for New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, you do a single day for each one of those days, and then either before or after that, date ranges are fine. You just do not want a date range that covers New Year's Eve and New Year's Day because the system basically just puts you in closed mode all the time. And then any changes you make, you click Save Changes. And now we get to the big one, incoming call handling. So this is how your system is handling calls from your main numbers, right? So people dial your main numbers. How do you want it treated? Now you've got your Open Hours tab and Holiday tab, and I just have only these two because that's the I set the system for 24-hour open office. If I had done the uh, custom office hours, I'd also have an after hours tab. And if you also choose close for lunch, you would also have a lunch hours tab. So you can have up to four sub tabs here. Each of these sub tabs has the have these three options. So first option, call comes in, comes to the virtual receptionist. All right, this is your standard, hey, call comes in, they're gonna hear a greeting, and then they need to press the menu option. So you click on virtual receptionist, so this window pops open. On the left-hand side here, we've got your main menu. So this is what people press on their phone to navigate through your phone system. All right, press one for sale, two for support, et cetera, et cetera. You would click on add route, gives you one of these options. Normally there's a pull down, it's not working properly. Uh, and then you choose where it's going. So this little icon tells me it's going to a particular person, so a user. Little multiple people. This is going to a ring group. Uh, this is supposed to be a headset icon. So this is going to a ACDQ or a call queue. You can also have it go to a voicemail box. Uh, right here we have it going to the directory. Um, you can have it go directly to a particular device on your account. We can. You can also have it go to a media file. However, if you go it to have it just go to a media file, after that media file is done playing, the call is ended. So not typically recommended. Over here, you've got your main greeting options. So first, you've got text-to-speech. You type it, you click Update, you click Save down here at the bottom, and then Save Changes, and then that greeting's in play. Right? Easiest, fast, and dirty, you can get it up and running 
and so you get things straightened out on how you really want it done. No charge for that. Upload your own file. Again, mono file in .mp3 or .wav. You upload it here, and it's ready to go. If you've already had recordings done or uploaded, this will be a pull down that you can go, go through them all and choose the one you want. You can record it over the phone. So this, system, this is saying, the system is saying, hey, you've got a registered white phone on, the, on your account. Pick it up, dial your main number, and then enter this PIN number, which will change depending on the time of day, right? So this is my open hours virtual receptionist. That's the PIN number for my open hours. My closed hours, or actually my holiday hours, would have a different PIN number, right? If you had lunch menu, also a different PIN number. And you can only adjust it during that time frame. So, like, if I'm open, but I want to adjust my lunch menu or my after hours, whatever, holiday. Let's say holiday because that's coming up, right? So, right now, this account is open 24 hours except for holidays. And I want to adjust my holiday menu. If I call in, even if I put in the right PIN number for my holidays, the system is not going to allow me to record it because I'm in open hours. I have to put the system in holiday hours then I can call in and record over the phone. All right, professional recording. So we have partnered with another company called Snap Recordings. And if you click on the order button there, it'll take you to their website. Uh, and you can order greetings. Now they have, they, they handle their own billing and their own delivery. They have 100, I think, 80 to 100 voice actors to choose from male, female, you've got English, you have different versions of English, like you can get UK English, Australian English, etc. They have a couple versions of Spanish and a couple versions of French, you can do bilingual. Um, they also have packages where they mix in hold music with a script. Um, so again, quite a variety of things you can choose from. They'll email you the file and then you would simply just upload it. Oops, did not want to do that. But yeah, then you could just upload your own file, and it would be in mono. Uh, and then over here, setting a number of retrials on misdial. Basically, your greeting plays, the system is expecting your inbound caller to press something, right, to continue the call. If they mess up, they hit an invalid entry, or they don't hit another entry. Right? After a certain while, basically, um, your greeting would probably play a second time. For instance, you can change this number here accordingly, but uh, if they don't choose an option, right, this is, basically you're, you're giving your inbound callers multiple opportunities to get to the right place. Now, uh, one of these, so here when I have, this is a default action. Now if you have a default action and it goes to say a voicemail box, um, some people like that, right? Saying, oh, they just misdialed. I'm going to go send them to this either to a virtual user or to a voicemail box so they can leave a message. The downside of that is robo dialers, right? Robo dialers call your main number. They hit your read, read, mistrial options. Then they hit your default option. They leave a message. So if you want to try to minimize robo dialers, do not have a default action set. would be my uh, recommendation there. Now, any changes you make on your virtual receptionist, you need to click Save here. And then you need to click Save Changes here for all those changes to take effect. All right, next option, call comes in, and you can have it go to like a group or a person, a ring group. You can have it go to, go to a queue, et cetera, and then it goes to virtual reception. So basically what you're doing is you're giving your inbound caller a chance for one of your staff members to con speak to them, right? So you have like a receptionist group or a front desk group, right? Call comes in, it's going to ring all of them. One of them picks up, hey, great, they can talk to someone. That staff member can then transfer them to the appropriate person or handle the call. Now, if none of your staff members are able to call or pick up the call, then that inbound caller goes to your virtual receptionist, so then they can hit a menu option or an extension and then try to speak to someone. And then the third option, call comes in. Again, it can go to a user, ring group, et cetera. In this case, though, if no one picks up, you're sending them to a voicemail box, right? Say, hey, boom, sorry, we couldn't take your call. Leave a voicemail. 
A uh, couple things to keep in mind here is when you're sending calls to a user or a group from this option, there's only it will only try to ring that person or per people for 20 seconds. That's hard coded. Uh, we can't change that. Uh, and then I'll go on to this next action. All right, main fax box number. You can unassign a number or assign a number to it as needed. Again, this allows you to accept faxes. Now, you can edit the fax box. On your account, that will work properly. On this one, it will not. Um, we had an initial problem with the test account. But it will pop open a window. It will have two fields. One will be uh, inbound notification email. So basically, you put an email address. That's the person who's going to get the inbound faxes sent to them. It'll be a PDF file. The second box is the permissions box. So basically, if you have your own domain for your company, so abcdogwalking.com, that's your business, and you have that domain, you can add that domain in the permissions box. Anyone with that email domain can then send out a fax, even if they're not a user on, the, your, on your Dash account. Right, so you have like an intern who you need to have them faxed out. You don't need to add them as a user and increase your bill. You can say, hey, here's how you found, send out a fax. Just use your email, send them out. All right, let's go up to numbers. So numbers, these are all the numbers on the account. And you can see that where they're going. And then you also have spare numbers. These are the numbers you're not using. Under spare numbers, you can also buy more numbers. You have local or toll free. So local, you're looking for an area code. Let us go with 703. I don't think there's any available, but we'll check. Nope. You can go back to search. No, that didn't like that. There we go. And then you can just click add as many other numbers you want. And then you would click buy numbers. And then it would add them to your account. Uh, some are for toll free. You would just click one of the toll free prefixes and add the numbers to the account and click buy numbers. A port a number starts the porting process. And you go up here to the right to begin a new port request. Uh, basically, you would enter the phone number you're going to port, and then it's going to walk you through step by step. Uh, the main things we need when you port a number to us is a filled out a letter of agency, or LOA, that's available on the website as well as in that porting process. And if you're, especially if you're porting a local phone number to us, we need a recent copy of the bill. Now, in the porting process, you can upload both those documents to us to get sent to our, our porting team, and they'll handle it. You should get a couple emails letting you know, hey, we got your documents, and then here's what to expect in the porting process. Uh, and then porting will get back to you about updates as they get them. Now, one thing to keep in mind is we actually don't control the port process. Basically, we get the documents, we submit it, and then we're waiting for your current carrier to get back to us. It's up to them to say, yes, it's released, here's the release date, or no, we're not releasing it, and here's why. Now, once we get that like, rejection re reason, we will let you know and say this is what it typically means, but in the end, the end result is typically if there's a rejection, you need to call your current carrier and find out what exactly was wrong, what information was wrong, and either get it corrected on their side or get us the correct information, and then we resubmit. Uh, porting a toll-free number usually takes anywhere from one to five business days on average. Local numbers, I've seen it as quickly as one day. That's pretty rare. Um, and up to six weeks, which is also very rare. Normally, it's in the one to two week range these days. All right, let's go to users. So these are all the users on the account. Up here at the top, this is how you add a user. You put, put in their name, first and last name. Then you put their email address. Now, each user should have their own email address. All right, that's If you put in the same email address, you'll get an error message saying, oops, 
something went wrong. And it'll eventually tell you it was because of a duplicate email address. Now, Dash doesn't care if it's a valid email address, right? So if you have someone use like you have a group of people who use support at virtualbbx.com, but they don't have their own individual email address, you can set them up as individual users just by support one at virtualbbx.com, support two at you know, et cetera. Right? Just because they balance the system isn't gonna let you not you know, even if the email is balanced, you still have the users created. Now, they're not gonna be able to use those email addresses to get their voicemails, nor are they gonna be able to use it to recover their passwords but at least they would be a user. Uh, then you can create a password for them, and then an extension number. Now, on this particular account, I started off the first extension as extension 1000. I could have started it at 8000 if I wanted to. Likewise, when you're creating a new user, you can give them a whole new main extension number, right? I can make it 3221. Why? Because I felt like it, or it's that person's lucky number. All right, uh, this is where you include them in the company directory, so they'd be in that download. Uh, but the main one I always say is this one right here, send credentials to the user, right? This is that way they have their email, in their email box, their password to get in. All right. Once you have a user created, you can always click on their name. You can change their name. You can change their credentials, meaning their email address or the password. Uh, the voicemail box pin. Now, if, you're, if your staff is just going to be using VoIP phones primarily, you don't have to worry about the voicemail box pin because they can call in on their own from their VoIP phone that's registered to them, and the system will prompt them to create their own pin number. Now, if you have users who are primarily using cell phones or landlines and they'll be using that to access their voicemail, then you as an admin need to set up a pin number for them and then the system will ask them for that so they can act, uh, access their voicemail. Send emails to an alternate address. This would be in addition to the user's email address, right? So that you want to send it to the user's home email address or personal email address. Again, here's the include in the, the user directory. You can uncheck it if you don't want them in there anymore or check it if you want them back in. Over here under user, um, this is actually a drop down, so you can make a user an admin so they can do all the functions we're going over right now. And then their icon would change to a person with a little blue suit. Time zone, this is what time zone that person is in. Language, English, French, or Russian. Uh, ringing timeout. So by default, when we send a call to a user, okay, we can't tell a device to ring four times or five times, whatever. We only control how much time we try to reach out to that device or the devices on that on this user. So the default here is 20 seconds. 20 seconds is typically plenty of time for a landline or a VoIP phone. However, to a cell phone, you probably want to include up this to 30 seconds, if not 45 or a minute. It simply takes longer to route a call to a cell phone than it does to a landline or a VoIP phone because those typically have fixed locations i.e. the phone companies or internet companies know exactly where those devices are. Cell phone, every time a call gets out, sent out to you, it's got to bounce over towers to find you. Now, in terms of practical use, you don't notice this, right? Your cell phone rings, you pick up, you answer. In terms of a PBX system, you will notice a difference. All right, and then your main extension number, basically this is saying, hey, this is your default extension or in one that you're primarily focused on in terms of getting your voicemails, et cetera. You can click on the extensions box. So users can have multiple extensions. Just a matter of, hey, click here and add another extension number. Phone numbers, users can have their own phone numbers. These would be numbers that go directly to them. They don't, so basically calling this number goes specifically to Bob, right? The caller doesn't have to go through the auto attend or the virtual receptionist and hit a menu option or remember Bob's extension number, they just have to hit the phone number. So for like your sales staff, for example, they can have this phone number on their business card, they hand it out, that way that person will call them at that number and not have to worry about it going to another salesperson. 
All right, devices. This is where you can add devices specifically to a user, right? So you have the users, you got the devices, you're like, okay, I can just add it straight to them. So you can have add from spare devices. That would be you have a device already on the account, you're just reusing it or assigning it to them for the first time. Like uh, if you have like a new location and your IT person had all the VoIP phones, so they just add them all onto the account, but they don't know, you know what device goes to who, then you come in later going, okay, that's Mary, that's you know Bob, there's Patty over here, et cetera, then you would add from spare devices. If you go from new device on the user itself, you got all these options here. So, SIP phone, again, a, type, a, speci uh, a particular type of VoIP phone. You've got these manufacturers to choose from. So these are the manufacturers and devices that we support what is called auto provisioning, basically, it's going to allow you to make use of the majority of the phone's built-in functions versus just, hey, we're sending a call to it. So you would click on your manufacturer, you find your phone's model, oops, I did not want to do that. Anyway, you would put the device name and then you put the MAC address. The MAC address, uh, usually a sticker on the back of the phone uh, that you would enter here. Basically, it's unique to that device. And I'm guessing I'm going to have to close this window and reopen. So my apologies. So after you added the MAC address and, and the name for the phone, you would click on Create Device, and then you would click on Save Changes. So that saves it in, within Dash. On the phone itself, you would need to log into the phone's web UI uh, and make a small update. It's basically putting in a, a URL on a field. Uh, and we have those instructions on the website. But basically that tells the phone, hey, go to this address get this your uh, configuration information, right? Your phone connects to us, Dad says, hey, look for, if this MAC address contacts you, give them the config file, right? So your phone connects, hey, right, MAC address, boom, file comes in, your phone reboots, and then it's ready to go. All right, cell phone and landline are the same, essentially, is you put it, give it a name, and then you put plus one area code and phone number, and actually, here we'll go down to Duke here. So once you've created the device, and you can see it here, Duke cell phone plus one area code and phone number, you can also have some ad yeah, options under advanced. So let me get this back to its default state. There. So this is the default of how a cell phone is added to the system. So when Dash sends a call to a cell phone, what happens is, A, your cell phone will ring. When you pick up, you'll hear a recorded message saying, this is a forwarded call, plus one. You press one on your phone, that's letting the Dash know, hey, yes, you are there ready to take the call, and it'll connect the call to you. If you don't want to do that, or you're adding a phone number, but it's going to an, an, uh, an automated answering service of some sort, then what you want to do Put a check mark here in this first box. Allow use of cell phones voicemail. So what this does mean? What this means is you don't have to press one to accept the call, right? So we hear the pickup tone, we connect the call. So great for automated an automated answering service because then your automated answering service takes over and handles the call. Uh, if it's going to an actual cell phone or a landline because it has a similar feature, 
uh, and if your cell phone voicemail picks up, then your inbound caller ends up there. Some people love that. Some people don't. That is purely up to you. Uh, keep a regional caller ID. With this check, what it means is on your cell phone, it will show your inbound caller's phone number. If you uncheck it, when your phone rings, it's going to show your whatever phone number the caller came in on, right? So one of your main numbers, for example, or your DID phone number if you have one, i.e., it's a one way to let you know, oh, it's a business call versus some random robo dialer or telemarketer. All right, soft phone. Little message there that you should read, but basically saying, hey, make sure you've got your E911 set up on it. Now, by default, when you're adding a soft phone, the system is adding you as a third party soft phone, meaning you're either programming a VoIP device that didn't show up under the SIP phone list, or you're using an application that's not from Virtual PBX, i.e. Uh, x -like. So you would give it a device name, then you would click, click on Create Device, and then you would use the SIP username here, the SIP password, and then this realm to program that VoIP phone or that application. Now, if instead you want to use the virtual PBX soft phone app, say on your Android or uh, iPhone, what you would do instead is down here, right, see it says use third part use third party application. If I click on that, now it says use virtual PBX application. I give it a name, I create device. Now, this adds that device specifically to this user, meaning once I hit create device and save changes, this person gets an email saying, hey, you've got a new soft phone. Here's your login information for this device. Go ahead and download it. Uh, we also have desktop versions of our app for uh, Mac OS and Windows. However, that does have a licensing fee associated with it, $39.99, I believe is, is what it's at. Um, and you can order that directly through the, the, through the web store, and then they'll handle getting that created for you. Web phone, again, you want to add this on the user specifically, not as a separate device on its own. You give it a name, and then you click Create Device, and then you click on Save Changes. Uh, the web phone, it uses the same login information as their dash login information, right? So the same email address, the, the realm, and the password. And they just, when you, after they log in, for instance, they'll have a link up here to get to the web phone. Um, and they can just go to uh, webphone.virtualpbx.net, I believe, is the URL. But they would use their same login information as if they were logging into Dash to get in. And then they can make and receive calls. But you need to do that specifically on the user itself. Uh, and then everything else is the same. So uh, next up, we've got user features. So let me go over here. Now. Every user automatically has a voicemail box created for them when, they're, when the user itself is created. Uh, it's intrinsic, uh, intrinsically tied to this user. That's their, like, their main extension, et cetera. And that, like, so if they're using a VoIP phone uh, and they have a voicemail box, their VoIP phone light will light up letting them, hey, you got a voicemail. That's part of the integrated nature of the VoIP phones uh, and Dash. Okay, so, but up here, caller ID, number, offer on. Uh, you can only turn it on if that user has their own phone number. And basically what you're saying is when this person makes an outbound call, they're using their own phone number as their caller ID, right? If I turn this off, it's going to be the default uh, main number on the account. All right, call forwarding, this is a VoIP phone feature. Uh, basically, it's either uh, off, on, or failover. So off means you're not using it, obviously. On means you're, hey, I'm going to be away from my desk slash my VoIP phone. Forward calls to my cell phone. All right, and then you put your plus one area code and phone number. Now, I have it here set up on failover, failover mode, meaning if my, VoIP, my desk VoIP phone loses connection for whatever reason, a, the system detects it, right, because it's no longer registered. And then instead, calls to my user will go to my cell phone. 
So if my cell phone starts ringing a lot, then I know, like, oh, what's wrong with my VoIP phone? Did, like, my VoIP phone die? Did I lose Internet? Whatever. Or did my IT guy change something on the router? All right. Hot desking, also a VoIP phone feature. You click Enable. Now, this is in the instance where you and your staff uh, are in a shared office environment where they may be switching desks from day to day. Right, so Monday, Bob sat at desk 17. Uh, it's Tuesday. Today he's at desk 23. Well, he still needs to get his calls because that's how he makes his money or that's what his job is. So at the VoIP phone at those respective desks, he uses he can log in. Uh, so for hot desking, the there's a feature code star 11 that enables hot desking on that phone. The the system will then ask you for your hot desk ID which would be the number you put here. I usually say just put your extension number because that's easy to remember. Uh, and then if you require a PIN, then whatever that PIN number is. And then the sense of, okay, you know, so hot desking is enabled. What that means is uh, when calls come to my user, it's going to ring to that phone I just en uh, enabled hot desking on. At the end of my day, I pick up the phone, I hit star one, two to, to toggle hot desking off, and now calls won't go to that phone anymore or calls for me won't go to that phone anymore, right? So then the next day, whatever phone I'm sitting at, again, hit star 11, my PIN number if necessary, and my calls go find me at my phone that I'm sitting at. Obviously, if you're, everyone has their own particular desks, you don't have to worry about it. Fax box, users can have their own fax box if you so desire. Um, Typically, it's recommended to make use of a phone number that goes straight to that fax box, um, although you can also use an extension. Now, if you use an extension, basically what has to happen is whoever's faxing in, faxes, you know, calls your main number first, they get to the main greeting, then they enter the, fa the fax box extension number, and then they hit start, start on their fax machine to start to send the fax. Um, Personally, I got so used to using fax machines because I'm old, or old enough anyway, uh, that you know I would go to a fax machine, I'd scan the document, hit the number, hit start fax, and walk away, and you know do whatever else I was, and then you know an hour later, whatever, check back to make sure the fax went through. So there there'd be a slight learning curve there for your people who are faxing to you if you use the extension number. Follow me. So this is if you have multiple devices. And here, actually, the default, when you first, the first time you use Follow Me or enable it, it's going to look like this, right? So your default, your item, your phones are set to do not ring because the system is like, oh, we don't know how, what you want to do. So then you uncheck each of the boxes. Okay, what do you want it to do? You can distribute it so you can have it in sequence. You can click and drag the devices. So you can change the order, and then obviously you can whoops, click and drag on the sliders here, and so I can have both phones ring at the same time, or I can do something like that. And obviously if you can have more devices. The main thing what you want to avoid, however, is something like this, where there's a gap in between because the system is, basically says, oh, the call ended. It won't wait a while and then continue on to the second device. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is this applies when calls go directly to this user. Like I came into the virtual receptionist, I entered this extension number or the DID for this phone number or for this user. Oops. Right, so if I called the 702 number, it would ring those devices in that order. Music on hold. Uh, users can have their own hold music. Again, mono.wave.mp3 under one megabyte. Upload or choose from a file and then click save changes. And then customize call recording. If you make use of call recording, this is how you set it up on a, on a user basis. So inbound internal means another user on this account called me, right? Inbound external means a customer called me. 
So uh, outbound internal means I called another user, and then outbound external means I called a customer. And these are all stored on AWS. Groups. So ring groups, these are basically departments. Click add a group, you give it a name, and you give it an extension. And the extension is basically so your staff can transfer calls to that group. Uh, and then you would just click and drag people over into the group. And you would click on create group. Uh, if you click on the name, you can always change the name of a group. And then dialing repeats with these little arrows over here on the far right that you can barely see. Basically, how many times can the inbound caller try to reach everyone in the group? So in this case, they can go through twice. Now if you click on members, now you'll see how the calls are distributed. Up here in the top right, this is your total ring duration. You can adjust that, in and this is measured in seconds. And the default is 120 seconds, so two minutes. Uh, this is similar to follow me calling, right? You can click distribute, have them equal. I can click and drag people around so I can change the order. And I can adjust this this way if I wanted to as well. Oops. And then you'll click save changes. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, so call comes in, let's say Duke picks up and he's talking to the customer. A second call comes into this group, Duke will hear a call waiting beep in his ear until either uh, Lala or David pick up that call. Right, once they pick up the call, then he'll stop hearing that call waiting beep. Extensions, so this is the extension to route calls. You can add multiple extensions. Phone numbers, so you can have a phone number go directly into this ring group. Again, so they don't have the inbound caller doesn't have to hit a menu option. And then you've got group features. So call recording on a group, it's either off or on. Uh, the main thing you have to remember is if you are recording, you are responsible for obeying your local laws. And then you would click Save Changes. Ring back, this would be essentially your hold music while people are waiting to get uh, to have their call answered. So the default ring duration uh, of this group is 120 seconds. So I would want to make sure that the, any file I upload, again, recorded in mono, .wav.mp3, is at least 120 seconds long because the system does not automatically loop the file. And then you would click Save Changes. You've got Next Action. Uh, basically, if no one answers, what do you want the system to do? Uh, typically, it's send it to a voicemail box, but you can also send it back to your main menu, right, the virtual receptionist. Uh, allow call forward. Again, this is for your VoIP phone users. Basically, if they know they're not going to be at their desk, if you allow call forward, then if they set up call forwarding, it'll the ring group calls will go to their cell phone or landline. And then caller ID prepend, this is also a VoIP phone feature. Basically, you can adjust the caller ID information that will show up on their phones. So basically, up here you can add text. On the second line, it's numbers. And that will add on to the caller ID information on their VoIP phone. Basically, it gives them a heads up about what this might be about. Devices, this shows your devices on the account. You can add devices here. Uh, the main thing I would say is for the soft phone, just make sure you're only using a third party soft phone. Don't click here, because then you, the system's not emailing anyone, so then they won't know their username or password. Uh, and then likewise for the web phone, it needs, the web phone needs to be associated with a person. So again, it doesn't know who to associate with, and I'm not sure how well it works when you assign it to them after the fact. I haven't had a chance to test that. Uh, but on this page, a red device means it's not connected, i.e. not registered. Green means, as far as we know, we can send calls to it. If you ever see one that's black, that means it's been disabled over here on the right. You can always click on the wrench icon to 
to look at different aspects of the phone. All right, we've got the advanced options here for cell phone, etc. Voice mailboxes. These are all the voice mailboxes on the account. As you can tell, user voice mailboxes are listed because they have an entry here in the user field. These other voice mailboxes, these are manually created by clicking up here. All right, give it a name, voice mailbox, and a PIN number. These are typically either the main voice mailbox is always automatically created for the account and is not associated with the user, so it's a default one you can use for anything. Uh, and then any other manually created ones, they're typically used for your, like your ring groups uh, or your queues. And then you've got your, basically if you manually create one, one, you want to make sure to get a media, either record a greeting for it or upload a media file, .wave, .mp3, etc. In mono, uh, recipient, uh, recipients, excuse me, you're going to want to add an email address so that way someone is getting notified of voicemail box, of voicemails that are being left in this box. And then the options is once you have the voicemail greeting set up, then you can click on already set up. Uh, and then these other options. Oh, delete after notification basically means once the email has been sent to that uh, recipient, then the system will delete the voicemail off of the Dash account. Uh, voicemail boxes are restricted to 100 messages, so you don't want to get a case where voicemail box is full and can't take any more messages. So if you're already sending it to someone's email address, there's no point in keeping an extra copy on Dash. Feature codes, I don't know if this is displaying. It looks like it is not. Uh, the feature codes, they're available on the Virtual PBX website. It's under Dash support. But basically, these are co uh, key combinations on your VoIP phones that you can make use of. So, like, the hot desking was the one I, I've talked about. But there's also, like, uh, queue login, uh, you know, checking your voicemail, et cetera. Then we got the call logs. So these show all the calls that come in or have come out of the in or out of the system. Right? Green arrow going to the right means that came into the account orange or yellow arrow going to the left means it's going out an outbound call. You can click on a call to get a couple, a little bit more information about what, what's going on or what device is being used. And you can click on the gear icon for some technical details. Um, our engineers are working on what we refer to as advanced reporting, which basically will give you like people's login, like login, log out kind of logs, abandoned call rate, that sort of thing. I don't know when that's coming, unfortunately. All right, so that covers your main Dash setup information, but there's a few other things. This is, your, well, support it refers to this as the hamburger menu, right, or hamburger icon, three horizontal lines. So we're on the dashboard. Next up, we have queues. So if you're making use of ACD queues, um, these are basically uh, beefed up ring groups, right? So the ring groups, op ring options were fairly limited. Queues have more or a few more options. Now, first thing to keep in mind, ACD queues are thirty dollars each per month. So, right. So I have six queues. So times thirty, that's one hundred eighty dollars a month I'm spending on queues on this account. So keep that in mind, um, as it might be. I mean, for some people they don't care. That's what they want to make use of. Other people, hey, that's too expensive. I understand. Uh, on this page, you can see if agents are logged in. In this case, they're not. Over here, you've got a gear icon. These are the settings, and these are the same settings that show up when you set up a queue. So you've got the name of the queue, an extension, or you can add a phone number so it goes directly to it. Queue routing strategy. Unfortunately, uh, drop-downs aren't working on this page, um, or at least on my the browser I'm using for streaming. So uh, round robin is essentially random, and it's the, I think it's like the last person to log in, or the most recent person to log in, will get the next call that comes in, essentially how it works. And then you're kept in a locked position. Um, you've got most idle is another queue routing strategy, meaning whoever's been waiting for a call the longest gets the next call that comes in. 
uh, least offered means whoever's had the least amount of calls offered to them, not necessarily that they spoke to, but basically whoever had the least amount of phone calls get sent to their phone, they get the next call that comes in, right? So Bob has had 20 calls offered to him. Mary's had 20, or sorry, Bob's had 20, Mary's had five. Next call that comes in goes to Mary. Now, there's also least calls, meaning least amount of connected calls. So in that case of Bob and Mary, so Bob had 20 offers, Mary had five. But let's say we change it to least calls. Well, if Mary has spoken to all five people, but Bob has only spoken to two, Bob gets the next call that comes in because he's at the least amount of connected calls. Uh, you can have hold music and, again, upload a file, one megabyte, dot wave, dot mp3 in mono. The queue timeout, basically this is how much time people can wait on hold, measured in seconds. The queue call limit, this is the amount of people who can be waiting on hold. So if you have it at zero, it means it's unlimited. Uh, timeout immediately if empty. This means if you have no staff members logged in, just immediately time these people out if you have this enabled. Escalation queue basically means, hey, someone ran, ran through everyone in the queue uh, and the time, their timer ran out. If you select a queue on the account, it will send them to that second queue. Now, if you hit, leave this on none, then you can say, hey, send it to a voicemail box so they can leave a message. Agent behavior, recovery time, basically after they have had a connected call, how much time does the system give them to get like a sip of water, finish up their notes before it offers them a second call. Uh, force away on rejected or missed, if this is enabled, basically means if an agent misses a call or rejects a call, then the system will put them in away mode uh, and they'll stay that way until the user puts them, themselves back into ready. And then agent timeout or connect timeout, basically how much time are we reaching out to that agent before we move on to the next agent. All right, blacklists. This is how you can block callers from reaching you. So first, you would click Edit Blacklist. You would either click Add if you've never had one, or uh, you would create or edit one of your new ones or existing ones. You give it a name. Uh, if you block anonymous, that means if there's no valid caller ID information, we're blocking the call. Otherwise, you put plus one area code and phone number, like I have here, and then you click Save. You go back to Settings. So here are my available lists. Here's the ones that I'm actually using, which is none. So I could just click and drag and click Update. And now that's an effect. So this had that one phone number plus anonymous. So a caller comes in, they don't have valid caller ID, they're going to get a busy tone. And that one phone number would also get a busy tone whenever they try to reach us. As an admin, you can get to any fax box on the account. And then you can see the inbound faxes. And you can also see the emailed fax logs to see what went on. It's obviously been a while since I faxed out. Oh, actually, it looks like someone tried to fax out recently. Uh, monitor is not currently working. Uh, recordings go to the call recordings uh, hosted by AWS. User portal, this is what your standard users have access to. And you, you, you do yourself because that's one of your options here. So they can see voicemails. Now, they won't, if you have delete after notification, they won't see any. Uh, call history, they can see their inbound and outbound calls their faxes, the contact list, this is basically every extension on the account. Conference, uh, if you're making use of the conference bridge, so here this you can invite people, so these are invite users on the account to your conference. You can lock a conference so no more people can come in, mute everybody, unmute everybody, and end the call. If you have actual participants in a uh, conference, you also have the ability to mute a particular participant, and you can also kick particular participants as well. And then settings and devices, this is where a user can set up their own call forwarding. Uh, they can also set up call forwarding from uh, the feature codes on their VoIP phone. Again, you get the voicemails, 
Okay, voicemail box on the account. Uh, and then you have the option to webhooks. Webhooks is basically making use of APIs to link Dash into other software. Um, and basically, I forget what the fee, what fees are associated with, but uh, we do have some white papers up on, I think, on the website now about how people have used it to help out, help out with their integration. Uh, but that is everything on Dash. Uh, feel free to use the chat if you have questions about a feature that you want some more information on or that I may have went over too quickly for you. Um, I'm willing to repeat things or dive deeper in. Uh, otherwise, I thank you for your time today and hope you have a good day. All right, not seeing any questions, so I'm going to go ahead and end the stream. Again, thank you for your time, and I hope you have a wonderful day.